Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be here. Everything's been great. Um, the only thing that I'm not grateful for is that I'm the speaker put after Theaster Gates. <laughs> what am I going to do? Anyway, um, <laughs> but as someone said during the tea break, you're different and it'll be fine. So. <laughs> Um, uh, I actually um, wanted to talk to you about the National Gallery uh, in Singapore, which is a new project. Um, I'm not involved um, in that, and I'm only a board member. Um, but I really wanted to um, draw you a sketch of what's been happening in Singapore over the last 25 to 30 years in terms of arts and cultural development. Um, a lot has been happening, and um, it is, in a sense, um, has transformed the, the city. Um, there were a few civil servants here yesterday, and um, I was a civil servant for 18 years in the museum sector, and I wanted to say uh, to the civil servants here that actually it is possible to create change from within the system, uh, and that's what um, I did. It was pretty frustrating. Um, I almost gave up a few times and you know, drew up my resignation letter, but you know, if you persevere, um, it is possible to bring about change within the system. Um, so I'd like to spend the next 30 minutes actually um, not talking so much about the um, National Gallery project. That, that's a 19, I think, 60s photo of the two buildings um, that will turn into the National Gallery, um, but um, more about the background and what has led up um, to this um, mega project. All right, next. Uh, yep. Yep. Whoop. Oh, God. I thought someone said it would work. <laughs> oh, oh, well, hang on. Back. Here we go. Yes. So that's uh, roughly what I'm going to talk about. Just a few words to start with on art in the city. Um, and um, just to say that um, I see a lot of street art in Perth. Uh, I'm not sure that it would go down so well in Singapore, but we do have, uh, some of you who know Singapore would, will know what I mean. Um, but we do have um, some of the more conventional stuff. Um, uh, these are mainly uh, the result of um, owners of buildings and developers of buildings um, wanting to brand their, their development and, and putting big name uh, sculpture uh, outside. So we've got you know, our Henry Moores, our Boteros, our Anthony Gormley. That's a, that messy one is an Anthony Gormley. It's pretty interesting. Um, there are some pretty nice um, uh, local uh, works as well. Um, uh, so that's uh, the conventional art in the city, but the underground system, uh, the MRT we call it, um, has also started to commission local artists, and some of the, um, some of the work is pretty nice, and um, you know, I guess that could be happening here as well. Um, but more than that, uh, the MRT has also been commissioning um, uh, stations or holding competitions for stations. Uh, and I think architecture is part of you know, this art in the city idea. Uh, and um, that's just one example um, by a local practice that won a competition. And you know, we're, getting, we're having some pretty fantastic um, uh, MRT stations in Singapore. Um, once again, developers um, uh, uh, commissioning architects because they want to sell their apartments. Um, uh, in fact, um, I find these are some of the better ones. Um, I find s a lot of architecture very disappointing, um, uh, and uh, I think our local guys are measuring up, measuring up quite well to these architects. But um, not bad. Some of these uh, cool house, uh, Lieberskin. We've got Thomas Heatherwick from the UK. Nice, quite a nice one. That's, that's just open. Um, I also wanted to introduce the idea that planning um, you know, is a kind of a setting or maybe it can be considered you know, a part of the experience of art in the city. That's not a ghetto, by the way. There are lots of design companies um, in those old houses. Um, and um, landscaping as well. Um, some of you will know of this iconic um, Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. Um, but what is less well known uh, is this um, really extensive system of green connectors um, that brings the outdoors to practically everybody's doorstep in, uh, in Singapore. Okay, so let's uh, go look at the policy backdrop. Oh, God. 
Okay, here we go. Um, Singapore in the 60s and the 70s was really um, not at all concerned about the arts and culture. Um, it was trying to get um, itself on the feet, on its feet as a country. So, you know, housing development, infrastructure development, roads, uh, jobs, uh, setting up industrial areas and so on and so forth. So arts and culture were definitely in the background. Um, however, in uh, 20 years after independence, um, there was this vision uh, for a culturally vibrant society. Um, it's, it's blinking. Okay, never mind. Um, uh, and then, uh, five, uh, five years later, uh, a committee was convened which made these recommendations. Now, what was the background to this? How come suddenly there was this interest? And I think um, one of the motivations was really um, this perception that Singapore was a cultural desert. Um, and I'm quite, I was quite interested to hear from uh, Carly Barrett's presentation just now that maybe a similar situation was happening in Perth as well. Um, and um, Singapore was trying to attract um, investments, was trying to attract MNCs, and um, it realized that um, yesterday somebody said something about retain, retain and attract and it was trying, obviously, to make Singapore a better place for its citizens, but it was also trying to attract other people to come and live in Singapore to set up businesses in Singapore and so on. So I think that was the motivation for that cultural vision and the recommendations. Um, I think some of you will know who that is. Um, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who died um, uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, yesterday, listening to Enrique Penlosa, I thought he did very well in Colombia. He might have done quite well in Singapore as well, um, uh, because uh, um, the kind of culture that Lee Kuan Yew set up was you uh, latch on to an idea. It might not be a popular idea at the outset, but if you think it's a good idea, you just go for it. And if later on it turns out to be not such a good idea, after all, you drop it and you go on to the next idea. So, um, so this thing about arts and culture and the cultural vision, I think, was one of the ideas. Uh, that the government uh, latched onto um, in the uh, late 80s. Um, he himself was not um, an avid uh, museum goer or an, or an arts lover, but I think he saw the logic of that retain um, and, um, and attract and retain. Um, so this is one of his visits to the museum. In 18 years, maybe I had the pleasure to show him around three to four times. So, and he might have gone to the other museums once or twice. So, you know, he wasn't really into, into art, but um, he could see the logic of attract and retain. Um, he then stepped down, uh, sorry, in 1990 he stepped down, but before he stepped down, he appointed two people who uh, were key in pushing this agenda forward. One was the first deputy prime minister, Mr. Go and the other one was Mr. Ong, who was actually a musician himself, an amateur musician, and he was instrumental in pushing the performance art, um, the performing art um, center uh, idea. He became subsequently the president, which uh, didn't hurt that project either. Um, and then in 1990, uh, Mr. Goh became, uh, took over from Mr. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, and um, uh, George Yeo was appointed, and he was actually instrumental in pushing uh, museum development. Um, in particular, the one that I was recruited um, to uh, realize, the Asian Civilizations Museum. So two new agencies were created, following on from the um, recommendation of that advisory committee, the Arts Council, um, to um, spearhead um, arts uh, artists, um, uh, assistance to artists and arts uh, pr uh, promotion, visual performing, etc. And, and the other one, the National Heritage Board, to spearhead um, museum uh, development and operation. Okay. Then came in 2000 this um, plan called the Renaissance City Plan. And when that was launched, I thought, where does this slogan come from? Um, and then I realized yesterday, after having listened to Charles Landry's talk, that it might have come from him, either directly or indirectly. So you see all these words, uh, global arts, uh, city, creative, uh, knowledge-based industries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah? But you see in Singapore, there's this, um, uh, Singapore's a city as well as a state, 
So there's always this city level um, uh, uh, concerns and there's also this national level concern. So that second point there is a kind of a national level concern in relation to um, the arts. Whoops. Okay, so there's a little bit more on that. Ensure sustained growth. Singapore must forge an environment conducive to innovations, new discoveries, and the creation of new lot of new knowledge. A at the time, um, I thought, oh, this is just you know, uh, this is just talk, and nothing will happen. But the interesting thing in Singapore is, um, once a plan is adopted, they just go full steam ahead, and um, they just carry on. So maybe we're a little we're a little bit more proactive than in the ne in the Netherlands, perhaps. Um, and then one year later, um, there was this economic review which said, which was a broad ranging review, but it also um, touched on the arts and culture and the importance of that within the larger economy. So that's a summary of the beginning of this um, whole movement. Um, what's helped though, of course, has been that um, Singapore's economy has, con has grown since independence for the past 50 years. So um, it's, uh, we've been able to afford uh, to put into practice um, some of those plans. The only sideways um, uh, uh, was during um, the Asian financial crisis. So you see a little bit of sideways movement there, but we've been doing quite well. So obviously, we've been able to afford to invest in um, arts infrastructure. Um, government funding to the arts. If you just look at the green, in the last six years, it's um, gone up by 60%. So um, it's fairly healthy. Four, I think 428 million for, for the arts, not uh, including the libraries, uh, as of two years ago. All right, so let's have a, I'd like to take you through the arts and arts businesses. Um, the Performing Arts Centre eventually opened in 2002. Um, it was funded um, in a very interesting way, which I will talk about in the conclusion, actually. Um, but so this is the largest um, performing arts centre in, in Singapore. But there are 60, there are over 60 performing arts uh, uh, venues, um, but uh, they're mainly quite small. So the demand for the medium-sized venues, that is bigger than um, 500 uh, seating, um, is quite high. So our colonial Victoria Theatre and Concert Hall was um, went through a four-year rehab and um, reopened last year. So that's on the right-hand side. Okay, uh, the national, NEC is National Arts Council, yeah, so their funding to the arts um, has been, uh, well, it's 75 million um, as of uh, 2014. Um, as you can see, over 50% um, it, is spent on supporting um, artists and arts groups, yeah, so that's their main focus. But in recent years, um, the um, the orange band, you see the orange band, which is four down, um, that's gone up a lot between um, 2013 and 2014, um, and, and that's a community arts engagement. So that's a new kind of focus um, to uh, promote accessibility to, to different communities, to the arts. So that's part of that. Um, where, where do all the artists come from? And the you know uh, uh, visual and performing artists. Uh, we've had um, long established schools, art schools, since 1938. One of them. Um, the other one, 84. Um, just in the last few years, we've, we have a school of the arts, which provides um, a kind of parallel arts and um, you know uh, education pre-tertiary. So that leads to the international baccalaureate. Yeah, and then they have. They spend the same amount of time doing that as they do um, on the uh, on the particularly art elective um, that the students choose. And then we also have a conservatory, a music conservatory since I think 2001. Um, one of the main platforms for visual arts of the art that the Arts Council um, supports um, is the Singapore Biennale. So that happens every two years. Um, and then the performing arts, uh, their main platform perform for performing arts is the arts festival. Then there are also uh, literary and music festivals. Um, uh, most of these are ticketed, but if you look at the upper right, that's the night festival, and that's, uh, that's a free event that happens every year. It's 
pretty fantastic. Whoop. Sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> it's gone berserk. We've got a preview of the whole thing. Okay. I'm not sure what I should do. Somebody back there, help. Okay, I think we've got... Okay, let me... Let, uh, was that where I stopped? Okay. Um, arts housing is something that the um, Arts Council um, also supports. And it's a very economic and low, uh, it's a low cost and very effective way of bringing art to the city because rentals in Singapore are very high, um, you know, and artists and arts groups um, have, you know, trouble finding a, a decent venue for their activities. And so this is something that's uh, started a long time ago. One lone civil servant had the uh, kind of foresight to push this scheme in the, um, I think, the mid 80s when it was all starting. Um, so, you know, it's, it's thanks to her that we have a quite a lively arts housing um, scheme now in the city and now uh, also in suburban locations. All right. Um, other agencies um, also are uh, helping um, to promote the arts, more from the business point of view. So we have uh, a body called the Media Development Authority. And that um, one of the, the things it does is to give grants to local filmmakers. And, you know, the big hit of, I think, two years ago was this film called Ilo Ilo, made by Anthony Chen, which won the uh, Camera, Do, Camera Do in uh, Cannes. So um, that's for the best uh, debut um, feature-length film. Um, the other body that um, promotes uh, arts businesses is the Economic Development Board. Oh, I forgot to mention um, the Media Development Authority also um, has been quite successful in attracting animation studios to come and set up shop in, in Singapore. Um, then the Economic Development Board has played a role in attracting or facilitating the entry of um, these kinds of um, businesses to Singapore, commercial galleries, auction houses, art fairs, fine art storage, etc. So that's um, one recent uh, project of theirs is to have a, um, a cluster of contemporary art galleries um, at a place called Gilman, a Gilman Barracks, an old colonial army camp. Um, the jury's still out on that one. Some are not doing so well, and some, you know, the bigger ones are doing well. Um, so let's see what happens to that venture. Um, art fairs, the first one was in 1993, and then there were three versions of that, and that died, and then Hong Kong came up. Um, and just in recent years, since um, 2013, we've had a, a major f uh, art fair called Art Stage that's now niching itself um, in uh, Southeast Asian art, and that seems to be quite a good um, thing for them to do because um, one of the high-value paintings that was sold at the recent one in January was by an Indonesian artist. I think this one might need to be auctioned off as well. This clicker, I mean. Um, <laughs> um, that's Masriadi. Um, but the most, um, the most vivid memory I have of, of, those, of, of the, those three art fairs um, was actually an installation by uh, Ai Weiwei, fantastic thing on the right-hand side. So, you know, there's a Southeast Asian component, but there's also an international component because their, their customers come from all over the world, uh, not only regionally. Um, there's a handful of um, um, local collectors who are now major collectors, um, uh, um, but the number is small. And, but there's a much larger number now of um, under-the-radar younger collectors. So we don't know really who those are, um, but um, there are quite a number of those. People in Singapore tend to be a bit quiet about what they collect, apart from these few big ones. All right, um, then there's also the, the Design Council, uh, which has been uh, in, in existence for about 12 years. And they do a design week. They support uh, design industries. They also try and interest um, play institutions like hospitals uh, into a greater design awareness and how design can help improve their operations. 
All right. So um, this is uh, someone talked just on about economic value during the uh, panel discussion. So there's some indication um, that this sector um, it, it does contribute towards the, the, the wider economy. All right. Let's on, go on to museums now, because I like to see the gallery, then the National Gallery project, as a kind of a development from that whole um, spate of museums that we've had since the mid 1990s. So originally, um, there were only two museums in Singapore, the old Raffles Museum, along appropriately, appropriately enough, it's located along Stamford Road, Stamford Raffles. Um, and then we had a small university museum, but this was the main museum um, up to the mid-1990s. And it was underfunded and neglected and really rather sad, and the typical dusty museum up till, uh, up till about the mid-80s when you know, they got a few million dollars Maybe it's at the time of this cultural vision, uh, and they used those few million dollars to upgrade their galleries, and that's what they looked like at the time. Still not great. They tried hard, but they didn't have much money. So then the National uh, Heritage Board came along, and this is what um, the National Heritage Board does. Um, it develops and operates museums. So um, the old Raffles Museum is now called the National Museum of Singapore at the top there. NMS, but apart from that, there's a whole host of other national museums, and at the bottom, there are several heritage institutions, um, and then there are also the archives and various heritage sites as well. Um, so, you know, all together, I think there are 13 institutions, and um, what is amazing and not really at all documented um, is the fact that all of these have come up in the last since 19 since the mid 1990s and just about all of them apart from the archives and, and the old national the Na national museum are new institutions that um, either had new bills or they um, uh, renovated old buildings uh, to move into so there was a huge um, a kind of expansion of the of the museum and heritage sector since the mid 1990s that's 13 institutions and 16 projects. So um, the Art Museum was the first one to come off the block, 1996. That's what it looks like today. Um, it inherited um, the collection of Southeast Asian and Singapore um, art, visual art, from the old uh, National Museum. And um, that's formed the nucleus of the uh, collection of the National Gallery, which will open in October. Um, the first Asian Civilizations Museum, which I opened in 1997. Um, sorry, the photos are a bit blurry, but uh, we didn't document it properly at the time. Uh, small building, 4,000 square meters, a new wing at the back. Um, we didn't have any collection. So um, most of, um, with the exception of what you see there, most of the galleries were filled with loans that I had to you know, hurry, hurriedly uh, assemble in about four years because I joined in uh, 93, and it had to open in 97. Um, so that was a huge challenge. We had the money for the renovation of the building, but we, and we had a little bit of money for the collection, but um, I had to borrow the rest. Um, before, we op before I opened that one in 97, we were already, we were already working on this much larger building, um, the Empress Place building, another colonial building by the Singapore River. Um, actually from the 1860s, but that's a 1930s photo, um, as the ultimate home of the Asian Civilizations Museum. And that was a hell of a project because it took seven years. Um, and I was in charge of the, um, you know, the building project. I mean, I, I was the client of the building project. Uh, we had huge engineering works because we couldn't possibly fit an auditorium with a raking floor um, into a national monument. So, you know... Um, uh, it was a, it was, it was a complex and um, and costly project and very drawn out. Um, by this time, we had a little bit more money to form our collections, um, so we had to rely less on you know the goodwill of uh, private collectors and other institutions. And um, by today, I think we have relatively few um, uh, loans, and the collection that you will see. Um, is mainly uh, ours that we formed over the last um, 15 years. 
Um, don't go and look at it right now because it's um, uh, it's in the process of being uh, renovated. So uh, by the end of this year, it should be uh, visitable again. Um, we were the first museum to actually do an all-night, 48-hour, uh, all-weekend opening uh, at the end of a, one of those blockbuster exhibitions we did. And that was turned out to be a huge success. It just caught on, and then other museums started doing it. Um, the old Raffles or National Museum um, had a, a very large extension in Mauve, you see on the screen there, um, which opened in 2006. So this, they kept the front half of the building, and then the back half was demolished, and they put this huge um, extension in. So you see, what you see there is that sliver of space between the old and the new, which is an atrium. And then in 2008, um, I opened the, I went back to the first building and turned it into a Peranakan museum. Uh, the Peranakans are a, kind of a, like a subculture, uh, Chinese or Indian, um, having adopted Malay, um, a lot of elements of the Malay world. And it, that, that was the first weekend. It was rather moving for me to see members of the community dressed up in their costume just to attend, you know, just to, just to visit their museum. So uh, that was a great experience. Um, and then uh, the art museum was starting to run out of space. So uh, it um, opened a, a contemporary art um, wing just uh, down the street in an old school. Um, there are also private museums. There are quite a number, and this is, these are just two of them that have come up in uh, recent years. Um, the visitorship at the National Museums, um, it's been going up, as you can see, the, quite a steep rise up to 2008, um, and then it's been leveling off. I'm not quite sure why it's leveling off. It's a little bit worrying. Um, in 2013, museums went free, so there's a little peak there, but it's still fairly flat. So let's see what happens um, you know, with these other new museums uh, about to come on the scene. So this is one that will open on Saturday. Um, I think this will have a kind of a niche appeal, so that's fine. I don't think it will affect overall with museum visitorship. Um, this is under the, muse uh, the uh, Na uh, National University of Singapore. So that's opening on Saturday. And um, this one is opening next month. The reason for all these openings is because this is Singapore's 50th ye um, year of independence and you know all these institutions have uh, uh, aligning to this uh, particular year. Um, so that opens next month, and I've sort of been associated with that as well in an advisory capacity. Um, there's also, at my ex-museum, um, there's an extension uh, opening at the end of the year. All right, so now and finally I get to the National Gallery um, project. Um, the National Gallery is, uh, can you see it? Yeah, it's on the lower left that red rectangle. Um, but I wanted to show that in context with um, the other national museums um, and the art schools and the performing art, the two performing, the two big, bigger performing arts venues. So you see there's a kind of a cluster effect developing. developing. What I haven't put in are the arts housing. There are quite a number of arts housing um, projects within that um, area as well. Um, in, the, uh, in the image, uh, there's the Asian Civilizations Museum in the foreground, and then the two old buildings um, of the National Gallery facing the green. As far back as 86, um, it, um, the City Hall, that's one of the two buildings, had been mentioned as a possible site, but nothing happened. Um, the art museum actually opened in another location um, in '96, um, but then uh, since it opened, there have been major donations, both by artist families um, uh, and by private collectors, um, and also by the Chinese artist Wu, Wu Guanzhong, whose family actually lived in Singapore, so he felt um, that he should do something for Singapore. So because of that, you know, the art museum was running out of space and another location um, had to be found. So this location, as it turns out, is the City Hall and the old Supreme Court. Both buildings um, uh, have played an important part in Singapore's history. 
Um, the city hall is where, on the left, is where um, the Japanese surrendered to the British. I think you see um, Mountbatten there on the, on the left edge, accepting the instrument of surrender. And uh, the following year, whoops, the, um, the war uh, crime trials um, took place in 1946 um, in the old Supreme Court. And then in 65, um, you know, the first Independence Day parade took place on the steps of City Hall. So it's a, the both are national monuments and, you know, they've played a big part in Singapore's history. So we had this competition in uh, 2007 and 111 entries were received, three shortlisted, I was on the jury and we picked Studio Milou. Um, luckily, not a star architect because I think his scheme is quite good. <laughs> It's very simple. What appealed to us was the simplicity um, and the kind of subtlety and elegance of his solution because they're basically two very strong buildings separated by a gap and how do you unite them? And he uh, proposed to do that with a glass canopy and making an atrium between the two and then uniting them physically um, by, a, by a basement. So that's the uh, glass canopy which can be seen from across the green. And that's the basement. And that's the bit that joins the two buildings. Um, I took the, uh, the image on the right-hand side of just a few days ago before coming here. So a fairly spectacular urban space, and that's the, that's the rooftop. How am I going for time? OK? All right. <laughs> um, facts and figures. So basically, um, as I said earlier, um, the, uh, the focus will be on Singapore and Southeast Asian uh, art with a little bit of contemporary because the old art museum uh, is in the process of turning into a contemporary art museum. So we didn't want too much duplication. Um, so uh, GFA of 64,000 square meters and 9,000 gallery space and 9,000 programming spaces. Programming spaces are the air conditioned but non-climate controlled spaces. We could have, we, we could have um, certain types of displays. Um, the project cost is 530 million Singapore dollars. If you look at it in perspective, it is not much more than what I understand has been granted to the Art Gallery of Western Australia for their project, which sounds really exciting. Um, and if you look at M Plus in, um, in Hong Kong, the Kowloon West project, I think their budget is double that. So, you know, that sort of gets it into perspective. Um, right at this moment, they're conditioning the, commissioning the building, so they're testing all the systems, and the hang will commence uh, next month. And as I said, we'll open, soft open in October. Okay, just uh, the building, the, this is the Supreme Court, has been beautifully restored. It's a 1939 building, just on the eve of the... Uh, outbreak of the war. So it's sort of like an Art Deco building, a late Art Deco, but it's been really well restored. Um, these are the two people in charge, the CEO, uh, Siap Ching, and um, Eugene is the director of the gallery. Um, so as I said earlier, you know, there's a kind of a city or institutional objective, but you know, because Singapore is a city as well as a country, there's also a national objective. Social capital. So these are the, um, there are going to be two suites of permanent galleries, Singapore and Southeast Asia. Um, so the hang will be thematic, but it has a chronological thread through it. All right, and then we have an, uh, an art education center. We have a resource center. We have um, uh, prints and drawings room, auditorium, you know, all, all those things you would expect in a modern art gallery. And that's how they fit together. All right, I'd like to sum up. If you don't mind, um, I'll, I'll read um, the conclusion. A recent book, Art, Culture, and the Making of Global Cities, describes the importance of culture and creativity have assumed for those cities competing for global status. The construction of mega arts projects, together with the rights to stage events such as F1, are seen to help brand a city 
and create opportunities for investment and tourism. One concern expressed by scholars is that in the race to be world class through mega projects and events, a disproportionate amount of available resources is consumed to keep these icons afloat, with the consequence that smaller scale and more humane initiatives, which citizens may more easily identify with and can afford to access, will be, will be neglected and wither away. While Singapore would seem to be a textbook example of a city striving for global status, the difference is that it is a country, as I said earlier, that it is a country as well as a city. And how these mega projects are perceived and received by Singaporeans is therefore of paramount importance to, to the decision makers. The Esplanade, the Performing Arts Centre, was the first mega uh, project. Um, it was funded, as I alluded to earlier, in an unusual way because um, it was entirely funded by the Turf Club and the Lottery, all right, instead of through direct government intervention. And both of those organisations continue to contribute significantly to the operational cost of the Performing Arts Centre. Since its opening, this centre has also taken care to be accessible to the public in its programming as well as pricing. Accessibility has been an overriding theme of the Culture Ministry for the last few years. The gallery project represents the largest direct, therefore the first, and the largest direct investment by government in cultural infrastructure in Singapore to date. In common with operators of other arts and cultural institutions in Singapore, the gallery will need to navigate between the global and the local. Global in terms of standards, and local in terms of what we call mind share in Singapore, um, and participation. The first three special exhibitions that have been scheduled um, seem to me um, to reflect this concern, to straddle both the global and the local. Um, had the gallery been a vanity project coming out of nowhere, its prospects would not have been very bright. We certainly don't want to turn out like this, the elephant in the room that nobody notices. I've tried to show in this paper that um, the gallery is the product, in fact, of 30 years of sustained and sometimes even frenetic activity in developing arts and cultural hardware and software in Singapore. This has been a multi-agency effort and nurturing of the software is um, still an ongoing um, story. However, we're starting to see some good results. The content is improving, and while I was in the museum, I tried very hard to work on that. Um, there's lots of choice in offerings now. Um, the attendance rates are quite healthy. They, obvi they obviously depend on what exhibition is on or what performances are on, but on the whole, they're quite healthy. And as you could see, the museum visitorship has been going up, although it's leveling off. Um, there are uh, starting to be some really interesting startups in the industry. And there's also a second generation of industry professionals coming on stream. Singapore oriented, so, sorry, Singapore originated art exhibitions, performances, films and design are starting to have an impact on the world. So more than just a lively scene, uh, what we have now in Singapore is an ecosystem and a viable structure for future growth. So we look forward to welcoming you to Singapore and the National Gallery come October. Thank you. <laughs>